So I'm going to speed through thoughts on title update 2 so we can talk about the main event, paid DLC. First to speak toward Violet and Mizutane, yes, I'm bummed it's fire mainly because in the two title updates that we've gotten, four of them are fire monsters. Especially in a game where we have one para monster, two sleep monsters, and a pretty lacking endgame water source with Mizu being the highest. As far as the monster itself, I'm really, really looking forward to the fight. I love the concept, and the palette swap is nice. Violet Mizutane looks really good. Risen Camellios looks sick, and the moves we can see in the trailer definitely have me excited for the fight. The only thing I dislike is the fact that it's tied to Curio, so it won't be a true variant and might not see the light of day outside of Sunbreak. Flaming Espinas is more Espinas with a varied moveset and one-shots. That alone is enough for me, but I also love the base monster, so I'm all in. Now we get to the new layered weapon DLC. In all honesty, my initial reaction was an uneasy, uh, you know, it's layered, so it won't have an effect on the game, right? Well, the more and more I got to chew on it, the more I realized just how bad it is and just how bad it's gotten already. The way I want to do this is I want to go through some of the various points and defenses for paid DLC and break each one down or respond to it. Background footage isn't going to be particularly important here, so feel free to listen to this kind of like podcast style if you'd like. First, I want to talk about the argument of it's just cosmetic, it has no impact on the game, it has no stats, etc. Right off the rip, this argument is irrelevant because the discussion isn't and hasn't been paid to win yet. The discussion has solely been focused on the fact that these layered armors, and now weapon, were always earned through quests and are now being sold to us. But let's say that the it's just layered argument was relevant hypothetically. Monster Hunter consists of hunting monsters and crafting weapons and armor from that monster. What do you craft the weapons and armor for? For stats, skills, and how it looks. And then when we speak of endgame, we can all agree that the true endgame of Monster Hunter is fashion hunting. This began with the introduction of Transmog, and it's only picked up steam with layered options. People literally have fashion shows in their community because people are so into grinding out the layered options to put together sets that they can enjoy and show off to their fellow hunters. If you look back to even as early as 4U and Gen U, the amount of weapons and armor obtained from them was loaded, and when we speak towards Gen U, it applied as both regular armor and weapons as well as layered due to the transmog system. But the most important part was how you obtain them. There was no buying armor for transmogging purposes. Every piece of armor that you wanted to use for transmog was available in-game and included in the original price you paid. Fast forward to now and there is literally so much money's worth of layered armor that you absolutely cannot earn in-game and will not be able to use in your fashion unless you pay the additional cost for it. Not to mention that some of them are sectioned off into individual pieces. If you have an argument as to whether fashion hunting is the true endgame or that people craft things for how they look, look no further than the monetization of that very fashion to tell you the truth. In some cases, I really do feel like people are being genuine when they say this, but I also know that this is also a bit of a justification tactic. The fact of the matter is that if you're playing Sunbreak, you've already supported the devs greatly. These DLC purchases aren't going to go directly to their pocket. This isn't some kind of creation club, but actually good kind of thing. More than likely, this DLC in an extremely popular non-free-to-play game will go straight to the execs and shareholders. I have to remind people as well that this isn't some small indie company that we're talking about. We're talking about a large developer publisher that has been on a hot streak too. They're not exactly desperate for funds. Generations and Generations Ultimate sold 4,300,000 and 4,400,000 units respectively. World and Iceborne, 21 million units and 9 million units, respectively. Rise and Sunbreak, 10 million units and over 4 million units, respectively. We can all do the math on that and come to the conclusion that there's absolutely no need to try and supplement with this DLC, regardless of how small it is. And I don't want this to come off as me trying to disparage Sujimoto or Suzuki or any of the other directors. They are the people holding back the flood of microtransactions and paid DLC. These come from executives that have absolutely nothing to do with the development of the games. Sujimoto and Suzuki are the floodgates. There was an interview asking about paid DLC and Sujimoto gave this answer. 
As you are aware, in titles prior to Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, cosmetic content was mainly available as a reward for free event quests. However, as character makeup and equipment designs can now be expressed more richly in the game, and as a way to make it easier to obtain cosmetic content outside of quests, we have also started distributing paid cosmetic content from Monster Hunter World. For the same reason, Monster Hunter Rise also offers paid content, but we are also increasing the degree of freedom of expression for character makeup and the number of equipment for layering and implemented in the game, so we are focusing on both free and paid content. I personally think this was media speech, but regardless of that, having the layer being put behind a paywall rather than being a quest reward is much less accessible. I don't know if we've gotten so detached to think that everyone in the world has all this extra money to spend on in-game transactions, but it's just not the case. There are plenty of people that still have to get over that $40 hump for Sunbreak, and if event quests are that hard, which they are drastically easier than the event quests in previous generations, it is very easy to get carried, especially with things like Discord and Steam communities. And if accessibility is the main goal, why not just have the option to purchase the layer as well as earn it in-game? That sounds like the most accessible way to me. We just need to skirt this idea of Capcom being an indie company that lives and dies by the DLC because that just isn't the case. The more discourse I saw on the topic, the more I saw people trying to make this a world versus rise thing. First, yes, things in world were less aggressive and we got way more from events than we do in Rise and Sunbreak. We actually got tangible weapons that were powerful and also available as layered weapons, etc, etc. Second, yes, there were people saying this when paid DLC came to world through housing items, hairstyles, styles, character edit vouchers, etc. We were the ones who blew it off and said, ah, eh, it's just housing stuff and hairstyles, no big deal. Just like people were saying no more than a year ago. And here we are. Look at these posts. Literally just a year ago, people were saying, it's okay as long as it isn't armor and weapons. That is the slippery slope that people for some reason refuse to believe exist. This isn't even a generation to generation thing. This is from Iceborne to Sunbreak. Those harmless items we thought nothing of, like housing items and pendants, were testing the waters. Hairstyles, character vouchers were their first steps into seeing just what they could put a price on that would previously be given to use for free. These layered armors and this layered weapon are now added to the pool. World itself even had layered armors in it as well that you had to pay for. It was just behind the deluxe kit or the pre-order. If you look at the surveys that they ask you to do, whether they tweet it out, however you get access to it, they are literally asking us what we would be willing to pay for. If you have faith that the paid DLC won't get more egregious then you're 100% entitled to that opinion, but the writing on the wall already isn't looking great. Now, this one is going to be a hard pill to swallow if you're a fiver like me or a super fan of Rise and Sunbreak. When we look at the events in previous games, the amount of tangible equipment you receive blows Rise and Sunbreak out of the water. The majority of event quests we have now instead give things like stickers and titles, which, if that's your thing, more power to you. But this is a discussion over weapons and armor. To be fair, there is still time in Sunbreak's life cycle and more title updates, but it would take a more than drastic turnaround for Sunbreak to break the trend it's currently on. It's going to feel like a bit of a twist of the knife, but even the events that do give you armor and the one event that gives you a weapon comes from previous entries in the series. Special Shades, Black Leather Pants, Diver Suit, Gala Set, Lian Set, Orion Armor, Blossom Set, and USJ Weapons. All of these are from previous entries. The exceptions? Capcom collabs for the Arthur, Akuma, and Sonic sets. Now, collaboration events is something that I don't even need to get into in the quality of them because I think we all know that the event quest collabs that we have in Rise and Sunbreak do not even hold a candle to Ancient Leshen and Extreme Behemoth. But if we were to do so, not only did we get armor and weapons, but we actually got armor and weapons with tangible stats, skills, and everything. The next armor advertised on the Monster Hunter Twitter the clockwork set you get from Celiana and Worldborn. The only actual unique layered armors and now weapon are the paid DLC. As soon as the rewards changed to things like stickers and titles, that was a sign of things to come. If all of this sounds fine to you, that's okay. We're just on different pages on this one. But I still feel like this was important enough to speak on as a content creator and a consumer. It's disappointing that more people aren't talking about it, but the only way we'll really be able to say anything is with our money. 
If it wasn't clear from the video, I'm definitely urging you not to buy these things. I know you may feel like if you don't do so that people that work on these games won't get their due, but that just isn't the case. You've supported them with the $100 investment you've already put in, and that's not even counting the previous games and expansions I'm sure you've purchased before. It's just a matter of what we want to see the future of Monster Hunter to look like. This isn't free to play Warframe with one of the best player driven markets. This is a paid game where we are in real time seeing things that were free, earned in game, are now being sold through DLC. I've loved supporting Capcom my whole Monster Hunter career, but I don't want to have to speak of them in the same breath that people would be if they were talking about Bethesda, EA, and Ubisoft. This is where it starts, and it's where it needs to end. Whether we want to believe it or not, that slope is slippery, and they're already adding soap. But that's going to be it for this one, guys and gals. I won't lie, making this video has just made me tired. I'm disappointed it even needed to be made because I didn't realistically think I would ever have to. And let me be clear, I hope that I'm wrong. I am hope that you guys can lambaste me with comments talking about how crazy I was in the future. I absolutely want that because then that means the DLC didn't get out of control. Just please take the time to think about it and don't make this a world versus rise red versus blue thing. Links for Discord and Twitch are in the description. Subscribe if you'd like. I'm gonna go take a nap, but happy hunting and I'll see you guys in the next video.